many aspiring artists literally grew up dreaming of performing before a huge roaring crowd but andy griggs didn't come to music until he was 18. yeah as long as i live there will always be a place you belong here beside me he was drawn to his art as a way of healing and his sound has been forged through the pain of an incredible life experience his is a voice filled with true emotion so i promise you now that you won't ever be lonely there is a, a unique emotion that he has that i think very few singers in this town have i think it comes the emotion comes from uh from his past you know and from growing so much and losing so much having survived more than his share of grief and personal loss Andy Griggs has channeled all that combined emotion into every performance. And the truth that comes across resonates with fans and fellow artists alike. I'm sitting with Martina McBride at the ASCAP Awards, and she turns to me and she says, the guy Andy Griggs, he's got it. Growing up in the deep southern town of Monroe, Louisiana, Andy never dreamed of singing country music. He spent his days playing sports, hunting, and fishing. But Andy's life was filled with music wherever he was. You know, I was raised in church, strict Southern Bible Belt, you know, and before I was learning Sunday school songs and church rhymes, you know, that children learn, I was learning Your Cheating Heart and Collagen, and Folsom Prison Blues, you know, I knew all those songs. By the time I could talk, I knew them, you know. Andy and his older brother Mason discovered their love of country music from their father, Darrell. Daddy was a big country fan, period. It was a lot of Johnny Cash. A lot of Hank Williams. I guess the biggest three that I remember growing up was Cash and, and Hank Sr. and Hag. And it was because of Darrell Griggs that Andy and Mason learned to take solace in music. Their father died suddenly of a brain tumor when Andy was just 10 years old. Struggling to cope with their loss, the boys went to their dad's room and played his favorite record. It was an album that, that my dad listened to. That's one of the ways we said goodbye in his room and we put that, that Merle Haggard album on and, and uh, played it. Please look over me while I They learned then, I think, you know, to stick together and, and to, uh, to let it go through this music. And I guess this is when me and my brother started realizing music was just more than music. Music was art. Music was a, a safe place. You know, they knew that in some ways that if you you know could sit down and focus that that the music that, that his dad loved could um, help uh, take away some of the pain of losing him. Though the brothers had always been close, the death bound Andy and Mason together as never before. The boys clung to one another, using each other to fill the void their father's death created. They were best friends. They were each other's best cheerleader. Andy was the athlete, Mason was the singer. Everything Mason did, there was Andy uh, helping him get everything out of the car, setting him up, you know, because you're doing good. And every football game, every baseball game Andy played, there was Mason walking up and down the sideline, you know, writing him a note before the game and leaving in his truck. Andy and Mason were more than brothers. They were the best of friends. So it was absolutely devastating for Andy when suddenly, at age 21, Mason Griggs died of a heart condition. Only 18. Andy once again found himself grappling with intense grief. He needed something to cope with the second major loss in his life. This time, he turned to his brother's music. I wanted to uh, learn how to play his, you know, my brother's music. You know, and I felt like, you know, I'll be darned if I let his music die. When Mason passed away, uh, Andy felt led to get out the guitars and, and and kind of pick up where Mason had left off. He literally picked up his guitar. He'd never really played before. And it started learning all of his songs just to carry it on. And that's what it got him in it. Maybe it was just for me. Maybe I won't play them to anybody else. Maybe Mama doesn't want to hear them. You know, maybe it's too hard on her. Maybe um, maybe I'll, I'll, once a year, I'll get the guitar out and play a couple of songs. But I'll be darned if I'm not going to sit here. I'm going to learn how, how to do this. Andy may have started playing as a means of grieving the loss of Mason, but he soon made a surprising discovery. He found a part of himself in music. You know, man, I mean, when I jumped in the pool, brother, I jumped in the deep end. I'd stay up all night 
just um, that guitar was the only magnet I had in my life. I was just, I was so drawn to it. Andy began to pursue music with a passion he had never felt for anything else. He soon found himself playing with Mason's old country gospel group, God's Country. Next thing you know, he's playing with some of his brother's musicians, same guys, and he's starting to play those church things and going out and performing. Andy began slowly working through his grief on stage. Audiences could feel the passion he put into the music. With each new performance, Andy's natural gifts flourished, and the young man transformed into a soulful singer. Eventually, Andy wound up performing with the gospel group, The Sullivans. It was there he met the youngest Sullivan daughter, Stephanie. The date was February the 25th, and, and I walk in, and I'm meeting them, you know, and there she is, and she was playing piano. It was really one of those moments where we both just kind of stopped. We'd never seen each other before, ever. <laughs> I, back home, we call it Twitter-pated. I sure did get Twitter-pated. I'm a Christian, and I believe that um, that God was going to send me someone that was supposed to be my soulmate, and from the time that I saw him, it was almost like something I didn't want to believe, you know, but it was so strong, the, the connection between us two, that I had to. And a year later, we get married. Uh, so I've known her exactly to the day one year, because we got married February the 25th of 95. Believing deeply in her new husband's gift, Stephanie encouraged Andy to follow his dreams, even though they both knew the odds were stacked against them. With $1,500 in their pockets, the newlywed couple packed up and made the move to Nashville. The early going was anything but easy. Me and my wife were definitely starving artists when we came to town, just like everybody else. And, and it's, it's hard. It's really hard because your story is no different than, than anyone else's. I was working at a daycare, and he was working at a uh, greenhouse. And uh, we were living at one of those really noisy apartments, you know, where you bang on the wall and you ask him to be quiet. The couple scraped by for several years while Andy worked during off hours with his manager to hone his performing skills. Finally, everything Andy had worked for began to come together. He landed an audition with the president of RCA Records, Joe Galante. This was his moment to shine. Andy's management team had a plan all set. When I had a chance to go into Joe Galante's office, man, they really, 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 really had been working on me about being politically correct and, and, and saying the right things, dressing the right way, uh, fix your hair this a certain way. Andy came in, um, and uh, the three of them came in the door. Andy sat down and, you know, hey, Hoss, how are you? The whole routine there. And, and he started to sing. And the biggest thing was play this, this song it was a great song, but it wasn't me. You know, it wasn't. It was a little. It was a radio-friendly ballad. You know, and it was real, real sweet and syrupy. And I said, "Is that it? You know, I'm not. Are you over with or whatever? But you know, is this what you want me to hear?" And he said, "Well, I got one more song for you." And then he did in the Arms of Cocaine. So I sang an old song called Arms of Cocaine, and not really. I didn't really do it for for the lyrics. You know, although it is a positive song, it's about a guy's woman getting off the coke. The feel of it is a feel that I've grown up with. You know, it's just that old outlaw kind of that wailing kind of feel. You know, it's an old Hank Jr. song. We were afraid to do it and had decided not to. And then in the middle, and, and Andy wanted to do it. You know, if I were to sing another song, I'd have walked out of his office thinking, he still haven't, hasn't seen me, you know. And I didn't want there to be any bones about it. If he, if he liked me, I wanted him to know what he was liking. As I've heard later on, everybody was just flabbergasted, and, and they were just really upset about the fact that he did that. I put my guitar up. He says, that ah, okay. And he didn't even tell me he liked it, man. He just stood up, and he opened the door, and he said, thanks for coming in. So we walk out, so my was I the unpopular one, you know, in that elevator going down. After years of struggling and hardship, Andy had finally gotten his big break, and it looked like he'd blown it. When CMT Inside Fame continues. I'm sure when he went down the elevator, everybody was going, oh my God, cocaine, country music, what are you doing? 